Now, natural church development has a very important illustration that I want to bring to you right now. And this illustration is called the barrel illustration. And natural church development talks about these different areas as being like the slats of a barrel. And in a barrel with these eight different slats, if you can imagine it, what happens if one of these areas is very small? Like, there's just no evangelism going on. Nobody's telling anybody about Jesus. What happens is, the water flows out of the barrel. And until people are trained in sharing their faith and begin to do it again, the slat increases, the church isn't going to be healthy. It's not going to develop in a natural way. It's going to be stunted because these things that we've been looking at aren't supposed to just happen once, but they're to be repeated and repeated and repeated throughout the life of a church. They're all important at all times. We're just talking about how they're, they're added by the Holy Spirit and the slats are put in place for the barrel. But if the slats decrease, they need to be increased. And so let's look at the next slat, and that is functional structures. Now, functional structures in a church are the forms that a church takes to fulfill their purpose. And the opposite of functional structures is traditionalism. There's some churches that say, we've always done it this way, and we're going to keep doing this, th th this way. We've always met in this place, and we're always going to meet in this place. We've always had this leader. We're always going to have just this leader. We've always worshipped this way. We're always going to worship this way. We have a constitution or a charter that was written, and we're never going to change it. You see, that's not functional structures. That's traditionalism that kills a church. And as we look at this Church of Antioch, it's changing its structure all the time. At first, it's just all these Christians gathering, and then they change by bringing Barnabas in, and then they change again by bringing Saul of Tarsus in, and then they change by bringing Agabus in, and then they change by having five prophets and teachers. They're all the time changing their form. There's no one rigid way they're doing it. And that's one of the things that's so important for churches to be willing to do. They ought to change their constitution once a year just as a discipline. We ought to change up how we do the worship service frequently, adding perhaps something like a testimony once a month, something like a um, poem, something like even a skit or a play, adding a trio that's never done it before, bringing children once in a while to sing in front of the church, creating a choir, creating a band, all kinds of different things. We need to keep changing the structures around. Changing leaders by adding to who is part of the leadership team, which is exactly what we saw in the Church of Antioch. The next essential for a church is passionate spirituality. We see this in the church of Antioch, verses 2 and 3 of uh, chapter 13. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, passionate spirituality is simply faith on fire. It's not a matter of being charismatic or not being charismatic. It's not 
not your style of whether you're liturgical or whether your worship services are really uh, hopping all over the place and very, very, very lively. That's not what we mean here. The essence of passionate spirituality will be involved, will be seen in things like fasting, in prayer. But the essence of it is what Jesus, what Jesus challenged the church of Ephesus to in Revelation 2, and that is he said, you've left your first love. The essence of passionate spirituality is, is that Jesus is my first love, that nothing else in life is more important than Jesus, and I'm doing the things that I did at first. I'm remembering how he brought me to himself. I'm reading his word and praying, and there's a passion in my life to know Christ, to make him known. That's what we mean by this passionate spirituality. And the opposite of it is the false fire of legalism. My favorite story that pictures this is a story of John Wesley. John Wesley, the famous evangelist in England, one day was with a legalistic preacher and he had just been preaching and this legalistic preacher was with him and they went out to lunch with a young woman and her father. She was probably in her 20s, beautiful woman and her dad. And as they were having lunch together, the legalistic preacher grabbed the girl's hand and said, what do you think of this for a Christian hand with all these rings on it? And Wesley replied, I think she has a beautiful hand. And later that day, that girl met more with John Wesley and her dad, and they became followers of Christ because Wesley had a love for Jesus and he wasn't hung up on legalistic things. The seventh area of natural church development is inspiring worship. Inspiring worship, again, is not one style, whether you're contemporary or traditional. It's not one target, whether your service is for non-Christians to find Christ or what we call seeker services, or whether it's a teaching service. <laughs> what makes for inspiring worship is that we experience God in the worship service. And what is it that leads a church to really experience God in the worship service? Well, my favorite verse is Psalm 78, 72 that describes this. It says that David <coughs> shepherded his people with integrity of heart and with skillful hands he led them. And I think this, is, this points us to what's necessary for inspiring worship. We need people with skillful hands. If somebody's leading us in worship and they're trying to play the piano and they can't hit a note, we're not going to be very inspired by the worship. If they're leading us with a guitar and they just can't play the guitar, not very inspiring worship. Now, they don't have to be a professional, but they have to have skillful hands. Or otherwise, we should find another way. There's some churches where one person has played the piano for 50 years and Everybody, there's no inspiring worship. You just keep listening to the same person year after year for 50 years, play the piano and get worse and worse at it. No, inspiring worship has to have those with skillful hands and integrity of heart. A person who will lead us into worship has to be a private worshiper. They have to know how to worship God. And then they can lead us into worship because of the integrity of their heart. On the inside, they're worshiping God. And now on the outside, they can lead us into inspiring worship. And so if we want to have inspiring worship in the church, the one who's leading us into worship can't be known as being a crook, can't be known as being 
a gangster. <laughs> no, David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And then the final area of natural church development is holistic small groups. Holistic small groups are safe places where people can discuss personal problems, apply the scripture, and these groups grow and multiply. Now, a holistic small group might be three or four people. I'm in one of these groups. I meet every month with three or four guys that are older than I am, pastors and former pastors. We're a small group. We hold each other accountable. We share with what we're learning from Scripture. We talk about our lives. We open up to each other. We can share our problems and our concerns there. Three or four. I know of holistic small groups that have 30 or 40 people. Sometimes these are called missional communities. If you want to read about something interesting, read Mike Breen's book on launching missional communities, where they talk about a holistic small group has 40 or 50 people meeting in it once or twice a month, or maybe even every, other, every week. It has a core of people who guide the group, but the goal is for half the group to be Christians and half the group to not even be Christians yet. But the Christians as a core group are living life together. They huddle every week. They pray for everybody. They have a heart for people to come to this group. If you want to read about one of the most exciting developments in mission today, read about missional communities. Mike Breen is one of the ones to look up. Mike Breen, B-R-E-E-N. And so we've looked at these different staves of the barrel, if you will. And they're all important. And what we need to do is we need to do perhaps a check every year, and we need to go back and we need to ask which of these staves have gone down and we need to strengthen them. And which of these staves are good and strong, and how can we use those stronger areas to help the weaker area? Because they're all important. And I hope that we'll be encouraged to review the Church of Antioch, to watch how it developed, and to see it through the lens of how churches develop naturally. You might even get natural church development material that's available all over the world and their questionnaire that goes deeper into probing how a church is really doing in these areas.